Well, it's a, it's a very good question because you do get one of these uh, cart and horse uh, uh, situations where uh, certain behaviors that are perhaps genetically determined may actually put a child at risk for lead poisoning. In other words, they may have uh, pica behaviors or repetitive hand-to-mouth uh, behaviors, and, and those may actually uh, not necessarily cause lead poisoning, but exacerbate lead poisoning. Ultimately, though, it is the environment that is the ultimate cause of uh, lead poisoning. And I just wanted to emphasize a point that uh, was made a couple of moments ago, and that is uh, there's been a lot in the, in the media about toys and other sources of lead, uh, and that got a lot of attention. Uh, ultimately, though, I think uh, we'd all agree that it's the child's... Uh, immediate environment, usually the home environment, uh, house or apartment, that is the root of most of the lead exposure. But in terms of adverse effects of lead on IQ at blood leads less than 10, there are now at least 12 to 14 peer-reviewed articles which indicate that the heaviest hit, so to speak, on IQ in children on average is uh, six IQ points, and that is the area below 10 in which uh, um, IQ scores are most quantitatively adversely affected. And then for approximately each 10 microgram per deciliter increase above 10, it's on average about about two IQ points. I would consider that to be settled clinical science and settled pediatric science. I don't see any controversy there now at the present time. Well, I think if it's less than 10, it's very hard given the fact that the definition of lead poison in New York, in New York and from the CDC is, you know, 10 micrograms per deciliter constitutes lead poisoning. And I've read the articles, or most of them, regarding the Lamphere studies and all of the people who've uh, given the opinion that you lose anywhere from several up to six or seven points for lead levels from zero to nine or ten. Uh, but at the same point, Dr. Lamphere and most of the authors will tell you that the sampling level is too small, and they actually tell you in the articles, don't use this as definitive proof because we need to do more research and testing. Uh, part of the problem is... Um, the plaintiff's experts always focus only on lead as the source of all of the child's problems. And the problem I have with what John Daly and some of the experts uh, who testify on behalf of plaintiffs is, is that if a child has an IQ of 72 with a lead level of 17, you heard Dr. Rosen say that it's generally accepted that you lose, say, two points for every 10 over 10, every 10 uh, microliters per, you know, micrograms per deciliter over 10. So if a child loses two points with a level of 17 over a level of 10, and we're not going to count the four, five, six that they're maintaining that he lost from zero to 10 because 10 is, or 10 is, nine is an acceptable level. How can you say that a child with an IQ of 74 lost anything but two points? which would put him at 76, which is within the plus or minus range of five IQ points, which is the standard variation on an IQ test. So while I agree there is some deficit, I don't think uh, you can quantify it and say, well, the child's IQ is 74 because of the lead. It may be 74 as opposed to 76, but it's not 74 as opposed to 100. Well, I would like to add one thing. So far, uh, the discussion in large part has focused on IQ, adverse effects of IQ at blood levels less than 10. That's uh, one compartment or component of uh, a vast literature. Uh, literature less on blood levels less than 10 have also pointed out in large databases uh, adverse effects of lead on academic skills such as reading and mathematics, visual spatial constructional skills, problem solving skills, executive functions like planning, organization, cognitive flexibility, as well as fine and gross motor skills and including also memory and language. So that I think to focus on IQ only is, um, 
is one way of looking at it, but the uh, gamut or array of adverse effects that have been reported in the peer-reviewed literature of blood leads less than 10 go far beyond uh, simple IQ, straightforward IQ measurements. Because, you know, Paul, uh, I, I wrote this down as he was saying, this is nine is an acceptable level. You know, our view on, on, you know, on the side of the infant plaintiffs is that no level of lead in the blood is acceptable. And that's why the studies recently that, you know, have indicated that there can be adverse effects of uh, blood lead levels less than 10 are important because in the state of New York and the city of New York, uh, and in the CDC, right now, the uh, action level is at 10 micrograms per deciliter. Uh, but that doesn't mean, as supported by the scientific literature, that a child can't be injured by blood lead levels less than that, you know. The, the claims that we bring are not uh, uh, the child was lead poisoned. The claims are that the child was injured by the ingestion of lead, all right. And as Dr. Rosen points out, there's, there's a, a wide range of, of you know, impacts that the the lead can can have on a child you know it's not just the iq it's you know his ability to sit still in class and perform and pay attention to when the teacher's talking and if he can't do that he tends to attract the you know animus of the teacher and and maybe becomes you know a, a subject of criticism and ridicule by other students in the class and he you know takes on a you know, identity of sort of the troublemaker, the the you know in in the class, and and his performance isn't good, and he may not even graduate high school, and then that impacts his employability in 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 you know later life. Will he be able to go to junior college or college, or you know, will he be able to hold a job?